Hello, this is Mary Cole with the Good Story Podcast, all about the writing life, the publishing life, and everything in between. I want to thank our Good Story Company team. You can learn more about us at goodstorycompany.com, and I'm thrilled to bring you today's show. Here's to a good story. Welcome to the Good Story Podcast. My name is Mary Cole, and with me I have book editor, coach, general, writer, helper person, Katie Wolf. And I will let you explain yourself a little bit better than I just did, hopefully. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. It kind of encompasses everything I do, so it was perfect. Um, well, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be talking with you. My pleasure. And, um, yeah, so first of all, I'll talk about my writer side. I'm a, a writer <clears throat> who's written two books and published a few short stories and articles online. Um, my first book is women's fiction. Second is a psychological thriller. Neither are published yet. I'm working on it, though. I have a fabulous, fabulous literary agent, uh, Molly Glick, at Creative Artist Agency. Oh, you'll be just fine, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so my book is the, the psychological thriller is currently on submission at the moment. So fingers crossed. Yes. Amazing. It's been all the, the nerves and, you know, obsessively checking my email and all of that. So yes, but it's we exciting. will see you in publishers marketplace, hopefully very soon. Fingers crossed. Yes. I hope, I hope. Um, so yeah, that's my, my writer side. And then I also have a, um, freelance editing business. I'm a full-time book editor and coach. And I should just insert a disclaimer here that I am almost seven months pregnant and I get out of breath very easily. <laughs> so if you hear me kind of feeling like I'm- No, congratulations. Is this your first? You. It is. Yes. Oh my yeah. goodness. I'm not going to so. say all the things that people say. I have three kids. Uh, so you know the struggle of pregnancy and catching your breath. and all that, that wasn't my particular- foible mm. in pregnancy my pelvis just kind of fell apart um but yeah it is a gnarly physical ride it is all encompassing so good for you for even being somewhat vertical i would say <laughs> you did it it's, it's honestly having the job that i have like i'm so grateful to get to have a flexible schedule and to arrange my working hours the way that i want so that i can be doing book editing in the morning and coaching which is when i feel most energetic and feel like, yes. are, and then I can rest in the afternoon. I can do more in the evening if I need to. Um, working for myself has just been the biggest blessing this pregnancy because yeah, I can't imagine. I don't know how people do it who have to be on their feet all day. Physical, working, yeah. Physical jobs on their oh. feet. My husband's a oh. chef and he's oh. on his feet all day, you know, and I just, I'm, I'm in your boat. I've been working from home and for myself ever since I've had a career. And it is amazing. But the flip side of that is when said child calls in sick from school or whatever, that flexibility is a double-edged sword. So I'm warning you right now, have some conversations with your partner if you have a partner and just be like, hey, just because I'm available doesn't mean I'm available. <laughs> yeah. No, that's something that we're navigating now is like we have a few months before we start daycare. And so it's thinking about, okay, how are we going to make this work? Both of us work from home. Oh, um, my goodness. Okay. So that helps in some respects. But yeah, it's definitely a conversation. And I'm sure we'll learn a lot as we go. Well, you know, I think it's worth talking about the different... You also were going to sort of introduce your editing and we sort of got off on a tangent, but I do think it's always worth talking about balancing your various hats, for example, your writer hat and your editing and coaching hat, but also the life hat and the I'm a serious literary person, dang it, hat, you know, that sometimes gets uh, gets caught up in, in life upheaval. So I think that's such a, I mean, I'm always talking to my clients about, they're always writing in and they say, you know, I'm so sorry, life got in the way, I had to move, I had to change jobs, somebody got sick, I'm doing caretaking, you know, self-care, which is at the very bottom of the of the ladder for a lot of people, the last thing people people think about. But I think it's a very worthwhile thing to always be talking about because we need to sort of refuel ourselves 
if we're going to be of service to others mm-hmm. in in the editorial uh, on the editorial side of things, or if we are going to be creators ourselves on the writing side of things. So I'm actually glad yes. that we took a little detour here. Yeah, I am as well. It's something that I think about a lot and I'm, I'm, it's an ongoing act for me. I've been, I've been full-time in this editing and coaching thing for about a year and a half, maybe. Amazing. Um, and it took a while to, to figure out the flow and to figure out balance and to figure out even my, my working schedule, like when I wanted to be working, how many clients to be taking on. Um, so I guess I can just kind of go into to the business side of things a little Please. bit now. Um, yeah. So I, I um, work with mainly new writers. That's kind of my, who I seem to attract a lot, which I love. I absolutely love working with writers who are working on their first book or who have written their first book um, and fiction. Um, So I offer two different editing services, copy editing and a manuscript evaluation, which is kind of more on the developmental side. Um, And then I also do coaching. I have like a six month program where I work with people to, to write their book and support them in that process. And then I also do um, training. So I'll do classes on characters or dialogue or editing your draft, things like that. Um, And so, yeah, so I've been doing this for a number of years. But like I said, it's been about a year and a half of doing this full time. And I just for a little bit of my background, I was not I was not one of those writers who's been writing since you know, grade school. Um, That's okay. I love to read. I was always a reader and there was always a part of me that felt like I had a book in me that someday this was something I wanted to do. Um, But it just never, it was just never something that I had the courage to explore, to be honest. Um, And in college, you know, I got an English lit degree, uh, went to grad school to be a librarian. I thought that was my career path. Oh, library science. Yes. Yes. I got a master's in library and information science um, and spent a couple of years. Well, spent about a year in the academic library world working in okay. college and then transitioned and worked in law libraries for about five years. And while I was at working as a law librarian, I just kind of got to this point where I looked at my life. I looked at what I was doing and decided that something didn't feel right. I, I just decided that, you know what, I've had this idea in the back of my mind that I want to try writing for years. Like it's now or never. I've got to do it. I was 30 at the time. I'm like, all right. Oh like, let's, no. An I old know. maid. I just no, had a birthday. Was, so I'm allowed, <laughs> I'm allowed to feel ancient for a second. <laughs> no, no, not that that's old at all. It was more that I just, when I hit 30, I really started to take stock of my life. You know, my yeah. husband and I had were about to get married, we hadn't gotten married yet. And so it was like, okay, what, what is, what is my purpose in this life? What am I passionate about? What do I want? What do I want to try? Um, so I started taking some writing classes, a lot of writing classes, um, did kind of like a, a really intense year or so where there's a, I was living in Nashville at the time and there's a great literary center there. So I was taking all these classes and so you did mostly kind of in-person classes at a at a local center. And did you concentrate on anything in particular? I know fiction has always been your, mm-hmm. your wheelhouse. So were you taking character classes or like whole novel classes? Because I think I think what's important to note here is you did get an English lit degree, but I don't know about you. I always hear from writers who are like, well, you know, I didn't go to school for this. Can I still do it? And of course, the answer is yes, you can, because writers we take from everywhere. We're like little crows collecting things from from all angles. You can train yourself by reading. You could train yourself by just sitting down and starting to write. There are resources everywhere. But I'm curious to see how you kind of cobbled together writing training on your own outside of an academic setting. That's a great question and something that I really had to figure out as I was going. Initially, I just started taking any class that sounded interesting. I took a personal uh, personal essay class that met over eight weeks, decided that wasn't quite right for me, at least at that point in my life. I took a dialogue class. I took a short story class. I took uh, I would go to this thing called draft chat, which is where you would bring something that you were working on and get feedback. So I got that exposure for the first time. Of, it's a little of, workshop. Yeah, uh, reading other people's writing and having them read mine and give me feedback. Um, I even took like a, a kind of a branding or the author business kind of class just to think about okay, Love it. do it. What does this look like? I didn't know anything about publishing. I didn't know anything about, 
I had no idea that there was traditional versus indie and hybrid, none of that. Um, so yeah, I really just tried to take as many classes as I, as I could and follow what was interesting. And then decided, I did write a few short stories in the beginning, but then um, decided to focus on a novel. Um, and that was, that was my first, yeah, that was my first kind of introduction to, to fiction and writing. And um, so that, so I actually got a different agent for that book uh, oh. and it went on submission right unfortunately, before COVID hit, mm -hmm. um, 2019, early 2020. And um, we had an editor who was interested and she got laid off because of the pandemic. And so that book just kind of died on submission. And um, so that was, was it really also exciting. women's fiction or literary fiction? Yeah, that Has that always been sort of your category? It, it, it that one was definitely women's fiction. Um, and what's interesting is that my second book that I ended up writing is very different. It's much more of a thriller. I sort of had a, a, I took a number of months after that book didn't sell and really thought, okay, what, what do I want to write next? What's calling to me? I had a lot more experience. You know, you, you learn how to write a book by writing a book. And I learned so much yeah. in that first process um, and felt like it was a good opportunity to just make sure that I was telling the stories that I wanted to tell and writing the books that I wanted to write. So that was when I, I decided that actually this story that I have in my head works more as a thriller than it does women's fiction. It's psychological. It still deals with a lot of like women's relationships and dynamics and all of that. But there's and I think that's really the sweet spot in the market right now. I mean, you look at a lot of the the thrillers would sort of be classified domestic thrillers, not domestic because it's women, but domestic because they have to do with those relationships, those intimate relationships where they can, you know, the highs are high, but the lows are devastatingly low. And I think that that is such a such a core part of the market right now. I mean, look at Colleen Hoover. Um, yeah, and, yeah. and basically all of these kind of intimate relationship. I mean, I'm, I'm just projecting based on the category that you're, you're telling me about, but I just want to say that that is, that is a huge area right now in adult fiction. Yeah, that's exactly what, that's exactly what I am fascinated by and what I want to explore. And it just was a matter of pivoting from kind of the topics and the way that I approach it. And obviously raising the stakes and making things very suspenseful and wild in the second book. Uh, but yeah, a lot of the same, same issues are there and that's what I like to read. That's what I'm, one of the genres that I read, I read a lot, but um, yeah, so that's, that was kind of the, the turning point for me after that first book didn't sell. And it was around that time that I started doing some freelance editing. I had always been editing for other people kind of like, Hey, will you, edit my med school application letter or we yes. proofread this or whatever. Um, that's, but just, that's the, that's the thing that English majors provide in the family. We have yes. a physician in our family. And so it's like, Hey, I have a rash. And for English majors, it's like, here's yeah. a resume. Same. But that's so funny. You say that. Yeah. My brother's a doctor. And I asked him at one point, I'm like, do you get sick of people just saying like, Hey, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like pulling rash. your shirt up and being like, look at this gnarly thing. What and he's think, like, Doc? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but exactly, exactly. It's the same sort of thing with, with me having that background in English. Um, so I took a um, an editing class online just to see. I still wasn't fully even convinced that I wanted to really commit, like, commit to this yet. But I thought, okay. I'm good at this. This is one of my skills from having this background in English and reading so much. And um, now knowing so much about writing myself, maybe this is something that I could do. So I took a class, started out on Fiverr, just doing the occasional client, making no money, um, but, you know, getting some experience and figuring it out. And um, yeah, then just kind of slowly worked my way up to taking my own clients, getting off of Fiverr and then getting to the point you know, last year where I felt like I was making enough and working with enough clients where I could do it full time. And um, yeah, and then through that, that process, you know, ended up parting ways with that agent, that first agent, um, amicably, everything was fine, but we just weren't yeah. really a good fit anymore. Queried again, 
um, and went through the process of revisions on my second book. So there was a lot going on last year in terms of like figuring out the business, yeah. again, revising my book. But um, yeah, yeah, I'm excited for being on submission and hopefully we'll have good news soon. So I just want to, we kind of skipped over uh, this like miracle timing here. You took some classes. Uh, mm-hmm. may, were you were you still working at the law library at this point or you were just, yes. yeah. yeah. so yeah, you were juggling some stuff, yeah. taking classes, doing the day job thing. And then you're like, oh, I just got an agent. And then I got another one. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> so the timeline is like two or three years during what, you know, maybe longer, because to me, COVID was like last year, but people now are like, well, Mary, it's been like four years. So I know time, time is a social construct. It has no meaning. Um, but basically, in the last like three or four years, you have drafted three novel manuscripts, and they were at a level that multiple agents have been attracted, including at least one editor who unfortunately, you know, the reality of publishing, and it's not just pandemic. Every time the economy sneezes, publishing is like, oh, no, no, (laughs) we are doing layoffs. We are not acquiring. You know, unfortunately, it is a very sort of, um, oh, they'll, they'll pick any reason to say no. But that's not to discourage anyone. But that is to say, you know, it is not uncommon to part ways with an agent, even amicably. It is not uncommon to have an editor leave, go on maternity leave, switch companies. It is not uncommon for an imprint to fold. At the time of this recording, we just heard that Inkyard Press was being absorbed into HarperCollins yesterday. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's sort of, it's always, it's always going to be something, but you have, you have batted, okay, I'm not a sports metaphor person, so I don't know why I keep insisting on trying to make them, but you're, you have a high batting average with relatively kind of few years. So are you just preternaturally amazing and talented, which I'll accept that answer. That's totally fine. What do you think you're doing so right to, to sort of have put yourself on this path so robustly? Well, I think it's a few things. And as much as I would like to claim that I'm some like, you know, innately talented person, I don't think that's true at all. I mean, I had to learn the basics of storytelling, the basics of writing, just like anyone else. I I remember I had this feeling early on that, oh, because I read so much, because I was such an avid reader and obsessed with books that I would just know how to write a book. Yeah. That it would just, <clears throat> you know, that it would just come to me so naturally. And Maybe it's that way for some people. It was not that way for me. The, my early stuff was just, I had such a sense of frustration that it wasn't matching up to what I wanted it to be in my head. Yeah. So I certainly started at zero. I mean, I, I really had to figure out how to navigate all of this and, and write a story and develop characters and write dialogue and all of this. But I think for me, what helped is number one, just being such an avid reader, being aware yeah. of you know, the kinds of books that were being written, being aware. Once I learned, once I, once I took that first class, it was like, okay, I want to learn as much as possible about publishing and what an agent is and how books get acquired and all of that. Um, So I think just gaining as much knowledge as I could helped so that I could understand the process. And then also not being afraid to share my work with other people and get feedback Mm. early, early on. When I was still, again, experiencing that sense of frustration where I had this vision for what I wanted the chapter to be and I would write it and it wasn't quite there. Yeah. But I just thought, okay, this is how I get better is sharing it with other people. So I, I did that early on and I did a lot of that. So I think that's that's one thing that helped as well. And then um, I just want to pull on that thread for a second, because there really mm -hmm. is a big difference in my experience between the academic and I I put reading in the academic category because you're sort of like you're ingesting information, you're, you're sort of seeing how it's done. But the workshop where you actually do put yourself out there, not only for your own benefit, but to read the work of others and kind of it becomes easier to sort of see some of these common issues with the work of others first. 
it eventually does trickle down to your own work, but there's still a bit of an ego barrier. And I don't say ego negatively, right? But we we inherently care about our work and are emotional about it and maybe don't have that same objective uh, perspective on it. But I think, so we're both freelance editors, right? I run a small group workshop where people give critique and give feedback. So of course, mm-hmm. we're a little bit biased about getting outside feedback and sort of the benefits of getting that feedback. This is not meant to be a sales pitch, but it sounds like for you, diving in maybe before you felt fully ready, before you were uh, achieving at that level that you saw in your head as as the goal, diving in even if you hadn't hit that level yet, seemed like it put rocket boosters and getting that outside feedback and even giving feedback to others. So it seemed like workshop really was the accelerant for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it, it, it helped me get comfortable with that process uh, because it was, it's terrifying at first. I mean, you mentioned (laughs) ego. It's like, it's scary as hell to put something in front of someone else and say, Hey, what do you think of this? Give me feedback. Uh, but it also trained my eye uh, mm-hmm. so that I could start to notice, okay, what's working in someone else's story? What's not working? How can I tease apart character issues, setting issues, plot issues, all of these different things, which strengthen my writing ability immensely. So that's that's something that I talk a lot about with clients on social media to any new writer is like, yes, this is very uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable yeah. and you are putting yourself in a vulnerable place. But the more that you can exercise this muscle and get used to it early, like the more that it's going to benefit you. Um, Yeah. And I I really saw that again with my own writing where it did not take very long from the time that I started writing to the time of signing with my first agent where I noticed a big difference in my writing. And I, what's, what's interesting about it is like this process continues, right? I mean, I'm sure that in 10 years, I will look back at this book that's on submission and think, Oh my gosh, you know, I should have done this, 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 whatever. Uh, because I look back at that first book and think, yeah. Oh wow, I've grown a lot, but that's, what's great about the process of writing is that we're always getting better. We're always improving. Um, And I think just having that willingness and like you said, like just diving in and saying like, I'm serious about this. This is something that I really want. I'm willing to do the work. I'm willing to get uncomfortable. And in my case, I really did see a big improvement in just a few years. Yeah. So I I was reading uh, a book just came out from Murakami. It is Mm -hmm. novelist as a vocation. And it's just kind of essays about the craft and about, you know, being a novelist and a working novelist and, and what that process is like over years, right? Because Murakami says that a lot of people have like one book in them, two books, but it's really in the longevity of churning out books and books and ideas and 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 keeping it going. That kind of stamina is not available to everybody, right? And one of the observations that I was just reading was this sense of, of just... Murakami cannot read uh, his past works at all. And I know tons of writers who are like that because even he said at the galley stage, when a book is basically ready to go and it's like, please don't have any corrections. He like gets his pen out and just marks up the whole galley and the publishers hate it because I think we're never truly done. And it's so humbling, but freeing, but also frustrating that a book is a time capsule, basically. And to your point, you know, if this gets published in five years, when you're doing something completely different, or the market has also shifted, which I want to talk about in a minute, you might look back and, you know, I can't look back at anything that's in print, because I'm like, Oh, my God, I see a typo. And it's it's going to kill me. My my uh, writing irresistible kid lit book, which I finally put my books in my little trailer so I can hold them up because, oh, you know, nice. publicity um, and all that horrible soul eating stuff. I spelled mustache wrong and the copy oh. editor didn't catch that. And I just I feel like tattooing my forehead saying I know how to spell mustache and it just bothers me so much. But I think, you know, I think letting go. And I think sort of, sort of celebrating, this is where I was, you know, and then moving on because it is a journey, right? It's not, 
as much as writers sometimes think that, you know, if I get an agent, if I get a book deal, if I do this, if I do that, then I will finally be complete. Well, spoiler alert, (laughs) um, the goalposts move because we as humans are phenomenal at moving goalposts on our happiness and fulfillment. And I think that's because happiness and fulfillment are not a destination. Mm. Um, But yeah, I think it's so interesting that you, what I like about you, (laughs) and I'm not just, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to flatter or anything, but you have mentioned now in 20 short minutes, like stopping and taking stock. Mm, And I think that kind of self-awareness and that ability to sort of examine ourselves and sit with our discomfort and really look at what might be happening, why it might be happening, that kind of self-inquiry to me seems like entry to the game for a novelist or for an editor. Yes. Were you always like this or did you have to sort of train yourself to really take take this kind of unflinching look at yourself and your life and your work? I'm so glad you asked that. This is something that I love talking about. And the answer is no, I was not always like this. Completely operating at a just com- a totally different level where I just felt like things were totally out of my control. I was on a path and like, whatever. And life was just, this is as good as life's going to get and whatever, you know, like I, I just, I didn't have the reflection. I didn't have the self-awareness. I didn't have the capacity for a lot of that. Like I struggled. My twenties were just a mess um, of oh, like, trying different things and just, I mean, crisis after crisis and figuring out who I was and what I wanted. And Are we the same stuff. person? <laughs> You know, it's, it's a, it's a roller coaster. Uh, so I, I got sober when I was 27, which I've talked about on social media before. Oh my God. I got sober. When was it? Mm, uh, eight years ago. Uh, so I'm not going to reveal my age, but around that time, are we the same person? I was going to say, holy crap. Yeah. I have nine, nine years. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. We'll chat. So we'll, we'll, we'll chat off uh, offline. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> so so you were sort of just just existing, right? Which mm-hmm. is the category mm-hmm. I would put myself in. Just existing, kind of going with the flow. You picked a oh. thing. You're like, I'm an English major. I guess I'll just starve now, and you know, just keep your head down, self medicate a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm projecting obviously from my own experience, but it sounds eerily similar. We know. did not plan yes. this before we got on the call. No, um, we did not. <laughs> and then you were like, you know, something should change, and mm-hmm. I want to do more self inquiry because this can't be it. Exactly. It, it really got to a point where, I mean, not just the bottom for my drinking, but it, it got to a point where I was so sick of being miserable and sick yeah. of being just frustrated at the way that my life was going. And it felt like this is the time for me to do something about it. I, it's going to be now or never. And I can't stand the thought of my life just going on at this same pace yeah. the same way forever, like decades more of this. I just can't imagine that. So writing, I, so I found writing a couple of years after that, you know, the first two years were just me kind of like establishing a new baseline of figuring yeah. out how to function in the world and how to like kind of take care of myself. And uh, so that was really the point when, you know, I, I discovered meditation. I started like journaling a bit more and just really, getting intentional about, um, well, first of all, like naming what I was feeling. I mean, I had no concept of doing that before. Like I was like, I feel sad or I feel happy. Like there was no, there was no in between. So it was like getting used to how, to identifying how I was feeling. Um, and then just, yeah, asking those big questions about my life. What do I want? What kind of person do I want to be? What are my goals? And I hadn't really thought that far ahead before that point. So initially it was kind of scary, but I think having that, having that happen in my late twenties and then having these few years to establish a a baseline and get a foundation under my feet allowed me to then go full steam ahead when I discovered writing and editing and just putting all of these pieces together. It's like I had laid that foundation already for myself to be open to those things. And I had tried 
it's funny. I had tried writing a few times before that, like in my twenties. Um, but it just never, I would, I was, I would drink while I wrote and it just never, it never worked. I would get like a page into something. I'm like, I don't even know what I'm writing. <laughs> I don't even know what this yeah. is. And it just never worked. So it wasn't until for, and this isn't the case with everyone, of course, but yeah. it, what for me, it wasn't until I got sober and healthy really that I could have the courage to write and to, 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 you know, jump in. Thanks so much for tuning in so far to the Good Story Podcast. I just wanted to take a moment and let you know that we provide marketing services for those pre-published, about to be published, and already published authors who are listening. Anything from a marketing and social media audit to customized marketing plans with support from our marketing team to done for you marketing grunt work so you can get back to what you love, which I would imagine is writing because uh, nobody really comes alive doing email newsletters. So let us help. You can learn more at goodstorycompany.com slash marketing. I do think that writers plumb the psychological depths of what it means to be human, what it means to be alive. I think it was Aristotle. I'm going to just butcher. I misattribute everything. I have like, you know, face blindness, but like quote blindness and like title and author name blindness. Um, But it's the, I think, Aristotelian question of, you know, how do we live our lives? And I don't like... I'm not saying, you know, stop self-medicating and go get sober if you like to drink. Uh, if you, if drinking is a problem, obviously maybe address it, right? But right. it's not a problem for everyone. It's not everybody's sort of escapism. But I do think that while you're medicating, while you're keeping your head down, it can be tougher to have something to say. Because mm-hmm. like you, I mean, I remember one time I was asking my therapist, Cause I've heard for years and years and years, Mary, you just have to feel your feelings. And one time I just like broke down crying and I was like, how nobody yes. tells you how to feel your feelings. You know, like all I know yes. is that I'm this like canister of rage, you know, which is, which is anger gets misclassified, but it means like you're frustrated. You have something inside of you that needs to come out and, and you don't have an outlet for it, you know? And, and it wasn't until I really started to sit with my feelings, become aware of them. I mean, this is in today's social emotional learning world where everybody is like, yes, your feelings matter, like da, 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 da. I felt like a, a prize idiot for having to sort of like learn from the ground up in, in my 30s. But I do think that you're working with psychological things in character creation But you're also, when you work with writers, I often joke that I'm an unlicensed therapist because you also take and hold space for, and I hate that phrase because it's just, it sounds so twee and precious, but you do hold space for other people's goals and other people's dreams and other people's sort of psychological portraits of themselves and their characters. And so it's just a lot of humanity that you sort of, that you're a conduit for in this work. And I do think that there is something to be said about getting on a strong foundation before embarking on it or as you're embarking on it, because things aren't really that clear and cut and dry. No, it's, it's so true. And I, I think about the work now that I do where I'm working with clients in a coaching capacity. And I think the same thing as you do, that is sometimes it's like I'm an unlicensed, you know, therapist for people because, you know, you mentioned something in the beginning of the episode that like life just comes up, stuff happens. We are whole human beings outside of writing. It's not like we're just writers and then everything else is compartmentalized. Like we are full, rich human beings who have all kinds of other stuff going on and mental health can affect our writing. What's yeah. going on at work can affect our writing, our relationships, all the stories that we're telling ourselves about why we're not good enough, why we shouldn't should just give up on this project, whatever it is like those all play into it. And I don't think that I would be anywhere near as good at what I do if I hadn't had that experience and gone through and done all of that work on myself, even though it wasn't fun, even though it was hard. Yeah. Uh, there's no way I could ever be working with people in this capacity. Um, 
and, and be able to really, again, like you said, hold space for people. If I hadn't gone through some of that stuff myself and kind of climbed my way out of the pit, you know, to get to this place now. And it's, it's so, I think a lot about how, um, you know, the, the relationship that alcohol plays with writing and how we can romanticize like, oh, sitting down with a co- strong cocktail or like Hemingway oh, it releases your inhibitions and it lets yep. the words flow onto the page. And if that works for you, that's amazing. Like have your, I know I have pl- plenty of writer friends who have a glass of wine while they write and it's great and it's wonderful. But yeah, for me, it was just a barrier. It was a barrier in between me and the things that I wanted to say. And yeah, there's no way I'd be able to tell the stories and, and write the way that I do now if I was still drinking. No way. Well, I think it's interesting that you say release inhibitions, right? Alcohol is famous for that. Um, but is there another release? Like if you are a writer that is telling yourself stories, which I very much, I very much agree with this idea of kind of self-narrative people don't examine their self narratives, right? And maybe they got them, it's a parent's voice or it's a a societal voice, a cultural voice that tells them things. Um, But, you know, if if you feel that you have a barrier to your work, if you feel that something is standing in your way, I think it might be an interesting reminder, like this conversation might be an interesting reminder to just examine what that might be. Like, are you really a failure? Are you a miserable, untalented, you know, like schmuck? Or is that a writing teacher 20 years ago who said that you should give up, you know, which is not a writing teacher's place at all. And I would say that person overstepped and and didn't take care with, with their job. But it's, you know, it, there are other ways to remove those inhibitions and to give yourself permission to write without doing it chemically. Like I said, I we're, this is not teetotalers meeting of the yeah. month. Like I'm not trying to push an ideology on anyone, but it's like, but I do think that sometimes people have these barriers conscious or unconscious to even calling themselves a creator or a creative mm-hmm. or an artist, you know, and it's like, mm, I can't, I'm too boring. I have nothing to say. And yet And yet there's a disconnect between that pressure and this internal sort of ember that you have that's like, you need to write, you need to write. And and people are sometimes very successful at dampening that energy, but but then it just erupts in misery. It erupts in other ways because I think those people who are called to write, who are inspired to write, it's not that easy to put that fire out. So if you find yourself with that tension on the one hand of, ugh, you suck, you have nothing to say. And on the other hand, I need to write with my one precious life, as Mary Oliver would say, you know, get right into that gap between those two things and figure out what the friction is. Because I, again, not a therapist, but I think in a lot of cases, you can remove that barrier yourself without needing to drink or needing to this or needing to that or needing to print business cards before you can start writing that say writer so that you feel validated, you know, like people put all kinds of barriers in their own way, which is not to disregard, you know, barriers of I need to afford a roof over my head. I have a lot of time pressure. I'm a caretaker. You know, it is a privileged position to be able to sort of indulge your creativity. But for some people, it is as essential as that roof over their head as, you know, like, that Mm -hmm. ember is not going to go out. And so what is blocking you? What is stopping you? It might be inside. Yeah. Yeah. And the first step is always awareness. It's always, what is this thing? Can I name what it is? Can I articulate and just shed light on this thing? And, and that's uncomfortable sometimes, but I think that's always the first step is just bringing it to light um, and not judging it too. That's something I always talk about with clients, like whatever your inner critic is telling you, whatever that voice is telling you, like name it, acknowledge it, articulate it, but also don't judge yourself because so many of the, the barriers that we think of as reasons why we can't write, why we shouldn't, why our story isn't good enough, all these things, like so many writers feel that way. It is so, many. so, so common. I mean, any writer I've ever talked to about this 
experiences this, clients experience this. It's so common. And there's something so comforting, or that that was something that was comforting to me in the beginning is realizing I'm part of this, this community now of people who have gone through this, have managed to find a way, you know, to, to write and publish and do all these things, despite that voice or that barrier saying, you can't do this, you're not good enough, whatever the, the voice says. And, um, and it's not something that has to be where we have to get over it before we can. Right. It. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm also someone who always misattributes quotes. I, I want to say, was it? Oh my Terry gosh. Pratchett is always a good choice. Alice Munro. I don't know. Like somebody. I'm throwing out names. Oh. Not helping. Eat, love, uh, the woman who talks about creativity. Oh, Elizabeth Gilbert. Thank you. I'm like Elizabeth something. Why can I not think of her last name? I think it's Elizabeth Gilbert in Big Magic where she talks about being in the passenger seat with that that imposter yeah. syndrome. You know, that, that, that they're your companion. The imposter syndrome and the doubt and all of that in this process. Um, yeah. It, it's not something we want to get over before we write. We just got to do it anyway. I have saved this on my Instagram and I will put this in the show notes, but there is, uh, I saw a woman whose name I cannot remember who did a graduation speech and it was this amazing take on imposter syndrome. Um, so basically around the time that women were fighting for suffrage, uh, they, <laughs> they invented, they being like the patriarchy, right? I'm not trying to make this a rant. Um, but they invented this affliction called bicycle face, which is so funny, um, which was this like tense concentration filled kind of like uh, face that women only, mind you, made while riding a bicycle. And they tried to make it like a thing so that, you know, women would get concerned and stop riding bicycles. Well, what was behind this? Apparently, conspiracy theory time. Women had started wearing pantaloons and they were bicycling to their suffrage rallies and and people were feeling very threatened by this dynamic. And so they tried to invent a thing um, to get put women back in their place. And this speech, which I will try and find and put in the show notes, was all about how imposter syndrome is the bicycle face of the new millennium because it is something mm. that is being sort of almost implanted in people to make them doubt themselves. And now it's like a thing and we can name it and we can sort of, we're like, yes, I do feel like an imposter, you know, but that has a sneaky way. The dark side of that, the front side is like validation and yes, other people feel this way and it's okay. And it normalizes these self doubts that we have. But the sneaky implication of imposter syndrome could be like, yeah, you know, I should feel bad. I should fake it till I make it, you know, and it kind of it almost like it almost has a counter effect to uh, to this more empowering validation part. I mean, I think you're totally right. People can't get away from self-doubt. And I think that they never will. But the the thing is to just do it anyway. There's a Ben Folds. I will never misattribute a Ben Folds <laughs> song. There is a Ben Folds song that's just like, do it anyway, you know, right. do it anyway, because otherwise it's just not, it's just not going to get done. And that little ember inside of you is going to be like, but what about, what about your creativity? Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned the dark side of that because I, I was thinking, you know, I don't want anyone to listen to this and think like, oh, I have to be feeling all of these things or there's something wrong with me if I'm not filled with doubt and dread and imposter syndrome and fear and all of this stuff. Yeah. And it, just as an example, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that I always felt like I had a book in me. I always felt like a writer, even though I was not writing when I was a kid, really, or until I hit yeah. 30. Uh, but there was a certainty within me. And I, I still have that certainty, even though I still don't have a published book, even though my path to publishing has been you know, not the way that I would have predicted with, with having a book not sell on submission and now yeah. going through this again, I still have an absolute certainty that I will be a published author, that I will go on to write many books. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I have that certainty. So yes, even though I still have some doubt and question, am I good enough? You know, especially when I'm drafting something new, there's always that voice. Um, but I, but I have a certainty. And so 
you know, I think that's something that a lot of writers can feel as well. Like if you have that burning desire and you know that this is something you're meant to do, it's okay to trust that. Yeah, I will. So I'm going to flip your flip (laughs) and, and say that, you know, self-awareness as I think we've established as the baseline for this conversation is key, right? But there is a brand of usually early writer that is maybe too confident in their work Mm -hmm. as is. Uh, And they have racked up passes and they're the flavor of writer who's like, all y'all need to get on my level. I am a genius. That's not to say that this is bad at all, but editor to editor, uh, you know, confidant to confidant for writers. If you see somebody that is convinced that they're up here, but they have work to do. What is what is a way to normalize that feeling as well? And sort of what prescription would you give for that kind of writer who who has that certainty, but maybe the craft isn't yet, or the market knowledge or the industry knowledge hasn't yet risen to the level of that certainty? Right. That's a great question and a great point because I've definitely seen that in coaching clients, editing clients, people talking on social media about their experience with querying. It is, it is common. So I think what's key there is the balance. Like, yes, keep that, keep that fire, keep that excitement, like have that be your goal in your dream. Don't, don't let that die, but also balance it with writing is developing your craft is something that takes time. It takes time. It takes feedback from other people. It takes learning. You're not going to know everything right away. You're not going to get everything right in your first book. And it takes a level of humility to recognize that and understand that. So I just think balance is key. Having the dream, having the passion, keeping that alive, but also enough self-awareness and humility to recognize that it takes time to to do that. And I, I think something with editing in particular is being open to criticism and open to feedback because the ultimate purpose is to help you grow Mm -hmm. as a writer. Mm -hmm. If an editor gives you feedback on something, let's just say it's not because they're tearing you apart and think you're a horrible person and you're never going to succeed. The the ultimate goal is to help you improve as a writer. So I think having an open mind and, and being open and receptive to the fact that you can improve no matter who you are as a writer, there is room for improvement. That's going to go a long way. Yeah. And I just personally and anecdotally, I can share that the the writers who tend to advance have a healthy certainty and have healthy self-esteem that lets them weather the, the low points. Right. But they do that humility that I could always improve. I think that takes you further than I know everything already. Thanks. Just give yes. me my book deal. Um, but I do, I do think it's a balance. And in terms of feedback, I was reading this Murakami book, which I will also put in the show notes. And I'm not like name dropping Murakami because I think I'm, you know, an elite intellectual or whatever. But he did write something that I have spent a lot of time thinking about, which is, you know, sometimes you'll get notes. And as long as you're open minded, right, you can have the confidence to be like, mm, especially if somebody proposes a specific fix hey, I don't think this prologue is working and I would do it this way, okay? What Murakami uh, found is true with his own editorial relationships is, you know, always take that first part of the feedback. Something about this prologue isn't working. You may not go for the fix that the person suggested, but that they had an issue with that portion of the story, the prologue, whatever, the, the midpoint, whatever, That is the feedback that you can take and then kind of, you know, puzzle over yourself because it just tells you that that something isn't connecting there. And that's the valuable feedback. The fix that somebody proposes, you know, in in workshops, somebody might be like, well, what if you made the character a beaver? You know, (laughs) I don't know where this person (laughs) suddenly came out of my head, but you're like, well... (laughs) I don't think the beaver's it, my friend, but you're saying something about point of view, which I will then kind of maybe take and 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 run with in in my own way. So I do think that it's like it's a balance of I am confident in this, confident enough to get out of bed and do it another day. 
I don't know everything though. And that's the thing that kind of keeps that ember burning and keeps kind of stoking those fires. Mm -hmm. If you think you know everything, but it's just the world that's wrong, that can also be a a bit of a dangerous kind of self-limiting position to take. Completely, especially when you are relying on other people to get you to where you think you want to go. I mean, we've seen examples of agents. Agents will share sample, you know, emails or responses that they get from when they reject a query. And the writer goes like, you have no idea what you just passed up. How will dare you? Sorry. Yeah. And it's like the nerve and the ego of these people to think that their first book that they wrote is somehow just going to be an automatic success and that this agent is an idiot for passing it up. Like it it just, it's mind boggling to me. Yeah. So I I really think it is. And, and, you know, I was humbled very quickly (laughs) when I started writing because again, realizing that the level of my, my skill was nowhere near where it needed to be. I submitted some short stories to places like Paris review. I mean, just, I, I didn't know. I didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah. And uh, quickly got humbled and realized my my writing ability was just not, it wasn't there yet, but that was okay. I was willing to learn. I had time to learn. I was going to put in the work. Uh, so yeah, I really think it is just a balance between having the, the self-esteem and the confidence, but then <laughs> realizing that there's so much that you don't know and there's so much that you have to be willing to learn. But that's the lifelong joy of it. I all so a lot of publishing and a lot of writing is also about expectation management, right? And at the beginning, you don't know what you don't know. It is a business. Unfortunately, it is a business that, you know, people are having layoffs, imprints are closing, you know, it's just, you're going to have to weather a lot of external things outside of your control and also internal things that are difficult to control, like that self-doubt, like the speed at which you gather those skills. The more you can focus on this part of it rather than that part of it, the better your experience will be. If all you want is that book deal and it's got to be a million dollars and you know a lead title with a big five publisher you're going to have a tougher time because the writers that really make it in the long term are the ones who keep working on their craft, no matter what else is happening. And um, I did promise to come back to market, but we ended up having a much, I think, more important holistic conversation. But I did want to ask you, you know, you, you just so happen to be reading and writing and really into a category that is very marketable right now. Do you ever see that shifting and how much how much uh, premium do you put on what the market is doing when you select what you're going to be doing? This is something that I am wrestling with currently as I think about my next book and think about what makes sense. Yeah. And I still want to write a psychological thriller like the genre isn't changing for me anytime soon. But but there are I have noticed that certain types of thrillers do it does feel like we're approaching this point in the market where it feels a bit oversaturated yeah a bit like a lot of the same types of stories are being telling are being told like the the five books that book talk recommends that are yeah. like female driven thrillers and it's yeah, just exactly. the same the same thing yes so that that worries me and not worries me i shouldn't say that but it but it's something i'm paying attention to as a writer and a reader uh how is this going to be shifting in the future and I think there's uh, there's an opportunity for just more diverse kinds of stories being told in the thriller space. But, you know, I ultimately, when it comes to me writing, I want to tell the stories that I want to tell. So I'm definitely paying attention to the market, but I'm also honoring the ideas that I have in the direction that I want to go in because I cannot imagine only writing a book to market and how tough that would be. Like there has to be something that, that really drives me forward in the story that I'm curious about, that I want to explore, that I keep coming back to. And for me, a lot of that is about, you know, relationship dynamics and female friendship and different generations of women and mental health and all of these things that are in this larger space of, you know, being a thriller and having some exciting things thrown in there. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see publishing at large, where things go in the next five years. But 
on a smaller level, just in the thriller space, what kinds of, of books are being acquired and, and published. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I think it's all about balance. I mean, we we just keep coming back to it, paying attention to the market, but honoring your own creative. I don't think writing the market is particularly bad or nasty. I, I agree that something about it should draw you to that market. And I do think that a lot of indie uh, writers do really well, sort of, you're like, I know my tropes, I know my audience, mm -hmm. it's this hyper-specific segment of romance, and I'm just going to, you know, but that's fun. And you're an expert right. in that space and you can write to market without it being a dirty word. But I do think that if you just try to pro prog prognosticate the trends and write to market, especially for trad, which has kind of a longer lead time than some indie, you need something about it that excites you. Otherwise... Again, you're going to have a bad time. You're going to have a bad time if you need to be a bestseller right out of the gate. You're going to have a bad time if you give yourself six, six months to learn how to write a novel, you know, and you're going to have a bad time if you don't pay attention to the whole creature, the whole animal and, and feelings. And yeah, I just think like growth as a writer is growth as a human. Mm, yes. Oh, totally. It's all of the things that we've talked about kind of like applying to just life more broadly, having a sense of curiosity, having a sense of self-awareness, paying attention to what excites you, but also having humility with learning new things, being a beginner, like all of that. I, I think writing a book, I say this all the time, but it's like writing a book or just writing in general is like one of the most amazing personal development exercises that you can go through because it forces you to confront all of these things and examine all of these things. And I had no idea I was getting into that when I started writing. I was just like, I want to write a book. This will be fun. Yeah. How hard could it be? Well, little did I know. <laughs> little did you know, but it sounds like it's also been incredibly rewarding, both personally, professionally, your clients who are lucky to work with you benefit from the work that you're doing. And it's just, mm -hmm. I mean, again, I'm a freelance editor myself. I work with writers. I absolutely love it. But I just think it is it is such a wonderful thing to be involved in on all levels because look at what's possible when you come alive and you help other people come alive and your books help your readers come alive. You know, it's just, I don't know. We're ending on a total love fest, uh, but <laughs> no, I think all the warm, fuzzy feelings, it's all the true. warm, fuzzy feelings. Why not? Life is hard enough day to day that you need a little, a little boost, but also a gentle reality check, I think. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you find yourself really resonating with this idea of like, what are my blocks? Like, what am I avoiding? Maybe this is your Wednesday or whenever it is that you listen to this reminder to, to maybe poke poke into that tender spot a little bit and and see what's there because what comes from doing that might surprise and amaze you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Get curious, get in there and see what comes of it. Get in yeah. there. Get in there, Katie Wolf. Uh, where can people find you and what do you have on your slate that might be exciting coming up? Aside from, fingers crossed, uh, a book? Yes, that's the biggest thing, hopefully. But I'm most active on uh, TikTok and Instagram at the Katie Wolf. And then I also have a writing podcast that's called Blank Page to Book. People can check out wherever podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts. And I'm going to be launching. Um, so I'm going on a maternity, maternity leave this fall. So I'm kind of taking a pause with clients and everything. But I am launching something called The Writer Shop, which is just a collection of trainings and resources for writers. I'll have trainings in there that are pre-recorded about different subjects. So characters, um, editing your draft, different things like that. So um, yeah, you can check me out on social media and I'll make a big announcement once that's, that's launching and available. But I'm excited about that to give people some more training and resources again, because I'm all about classes and workshops and, you know, using, taking advantage of those things to help you improve your craft. So you did a lot of that, that and now you are paying it forward and it sounds like people can learn asynchronously and mm -hmm. however, exactly. you know, 
just like us, a good story company. We want to be where people are and in a format that uh, that helps as many writers as possible. So, yeah, exactly. And best of luck with that baby. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be an interesting uh, process of navigating all the things. But the next time I see it. you, you will have these these beautiful bags under your eyes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the dark circle. And these beautiful the- wrinkles. <laughs> greasy hair it'll just i'll just be a mess i'm sure but uh yeah a good but you mess. know what sometimes uh people make a mess look good uh <laughs> which is what i keep telling myself no you have been a delight and just such an amazing conversation er, left turn about the holistic writer and this just the mindset behind writing and supporting others and supporting yourself I'm so happy that we took that detour. That was fantastic. Me too. Craft schmaft. I know. <laughs> no, I'm I'm kidding, but uh, but it all has it all has a place at the table. Yeah. Katie Wolf, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been Good Story Podcast, and here's to a good story. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Thanks so much for joining me. This has been Good Story Podcast with me, Mary Cole. I just want to offer a heartfelt thank you and bit of gratitude to the entire Good Story Company team. You can find out more at goodstorycompany.com. And of course, to all of you listening and taking the time to really dig into these conversations with me, this has been Good Story Podcast. And here's to a good story. Mm -hmm.